We are starting a new series today, and it's all about the book of Ruth, right? And sometimes this word, I think it's the gospel according to Ruth, right? What that means is the good news that's found in the book of Ruth, like the truth that we can pull out of God's word. And what's super amazing is like, you guys know me, like my mind works in movies. This is not a movie that I would pick to see, right? Like this would be a chick flick. All right, there's no blow up, there's no action, there's no fight scenes, there's no crazy miracles of the splitting of the Red Sea. But after reading this book and spending time in this book, even though there's only 85 verses and 55 of them are talking, right, chick flick, all day long, (laughs) even though, right, there's so much up, man, it is so rich with truth that can apply to any of our lives. And that's the goal, right? Over these next four weeks, you're literally gonna hear stories of of literal life change that happened because of this book. And that's what we are gonna do these next four weeks is we're just gonna pull some of these different themes, some of these different applications. If you've read this before, I think you're gonna see some stuff that you've never seen. And if you've never read it before, even better because you're gonna see some things for the first time time and it's it's exciting because even just this past week studying for this I had written some stuff and I was like oh man I didn't even catch that and and I'm I'm reading it and reading it and reading it again and so it's just an exciting thing and one of the things that we want to do is we've talked to some of you guys and we love when we read scripture together but we've also heard Hey, it's hard. Sometimes I don't understand it. I don't know how much to read. I don't know when to read. I, don't, I, I, don't, I just don't know. And so <clears throat> we were sitting down as campus pastors and Jim, he came up with this super cool resource. Um, there, there may or may not be a slide with it behind me, um, but it's a, a journal for every day, Monday through Friday for the next four weeks. There's an electronic copy that I am going to send out. I'm going to text you, right? How many of you guys got a text from Northridge last week? If your hand is down, fill out that connect card, put your name and cell phone number, and I will add it in, and I will text it to you. Um, We got a a free texting service. You're not going to get spammed with 100 messages. If you respond, it doesn't go to everyone. It's just a you and me kind of thing. It's a way you can let us know prayer requests real easy. Um, And so... That's an awesome resource. But if you're like, hey, I'd rather have a paper copy. You can't have this one. This one's Ned's. But I can copy Ned's. He will gladly share. So if you would like a copy of this, like your old school, I like a paper version. Um, Let me know after service. We'll make some copies. But the electronic version is a full PDF. You can literally type in, write in. But it's just an awesome way that we're going to go through this entire book of Ruth together. Because it's an incredible story. Right, of Ruth, that's the the main character of the book, but there's so many other characters that you can pull and you can glean and you can you can listen to and and as we were talking before service, we're gonna pray in a second, but I want you to think about this question. Have you ever found your life to be in a place that you never thought it would be? Right? Most people that are laughing or smiling were like, Yeah, here in East Tennessee, right now. (laughs) Right? I never thought I would end up here. I left the goodness of the north to come to the even betterness of the south. See, that's not a word, but we can make it up down here because we're in the south. (laughs) Right, but have you ever found yourself, have you ever been somewhere you're like, I I didn't expect to be here? And if that answer is yes, man, wait till you dive into these first few verses of this chapter. So let's pray before I get excited. Okay, let's, let's pray. God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your Holy Spirit and how you speak to us and how you lead us, you draw us. And I thank you um, that we are here now just to sit under your power and your word, God. So I just pray that everything that is said would bring honor and glory to you and that it would impact and change our lives. God, that your spirit would change us and mold us and shape us and to make us more and more into who Jesus calls us to be. I pray that you would get rid of any distractions, any fears, any doubts, and you would open our eyes and you would open our ears to see and hear your truth in whatever way that you would have, God. And we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, so we're going to jump right in, right? We're, we're jumping right in to Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, and this is what it says. 
in the days when the judges ruled. And I want you to pause there. Because if you have an old school paper Bible, right, if you have it, if you're on Ruth 1 and you turn the page, you know, book right before it, what's the book? Judges. Judges was a time when Israel didn't have a leader and these judges started taking over, right? The last verse in Judges tells us there was no king in Israel and the people, right, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Does that sound like a time any of you are currently living in? Right? Everyone is doing whatever they want. Put it in our language. I'm just doing my truth. You do your truth. As if that were a real thing. Right? And so Judges literally tells us, hey, here's a time. We're done. And most people, there's no king. There's no leader. There's no ruler. And everybody's just kind of doing whatever they think is right. Right? They're giving it their best shot. Okay, so that's where we're at. Just wanted to make that connection. Ruth 1, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while. Somebody say a while. Okay, a while in the country of Moab. Let's get a little backstory, right? The man's name was Elimelech. His wife, just say that, Elimelech. Isn't that just fun to say? Like, just say that the next time you're mad and you will instantly no longer be mad, right? The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Okay, so I'm going to geek out. You guys know I like a little history. I want to break down these characters for you. So first, we have Elimelech. Man, so fun. And you know what his name means? His name means my God is king. Then you have his wife, Naomi, and her name means sweet or pleasant, right? They're going to have a really great family until you get to their kids, right? Look, at, like, how would you name this your child? Some of you got some cool, unique names, right? Like, you like some far-fetched names. But would you ever name your kids sick and tired? <laughs> right? Malon means sick or sickly. Could you imagine how'd you get my name? Well, let me just tell you, the day you came, (laughs) ugly. We just didn't think you were going to make it, man. You were sick. Or maybe they were like up north, like, dude, this kid's going to be sick. I didn't meet him. And then you get Killian. His name is frail or tired. So their names are literally sick and tired. So I want you to imagine that, right? Like we have... Northwest and people being named after fruits and medicine, but I've never met a kid named sick or tired. So this dad, right, he moves his family to Moab because there's a famine. Seems like a pretty good idea, right? If you were living somewhere, times got a little tough, food was getting harder to come by, most people would probably choose to leave. But this family chose to go to a place called Moab. And Moab is about 50 miles away from Bethlehem. You throw that picture up there. So you see Bethlehem, red dot on the left. They have to go up and around the sea and down to Moab. It's 50 miles. So the average person walks three miles an hour. That's a 17-hour trip. Okay, so a couple-day trip, and they were there. Now, why is this a problem, right? You guys know Scripture's all connected, and there's so many places. Well, Moab is a place that God strictly forbid his people to moving to, right? If if you know scripture, Genesis 19, which I got a crew of people who just read that the other week, you learn who Moab is and where all these people come from, right? Moab comes from Genesis 19, Lot's daughters get him drunk, and they're like, hey, we need need to make some kids. Well, you use your imagination because there's some kids in there, But the Moabites were birthed from incest, right? Dad is drunk because of his daughters. Daughters make some bad decisions and out comes Moab, right? And so this is where this country, this is where this people group comes from. And that's just the beginning of their issues, right? They worship a false god. um, And I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. Chemosh sounds like something you would eat at Sahib, right? (laughs) Sounds tasty. But this guy, 
he was a terrible God. And these people, they would sacrifice their kids to this God. Like crazy group of people. And God talks about Moab in Psalm 68, right? 60 breath, verse 8. And he says, yeah, Moab is my wash basin for my feet. Right? There's a lot of things that I want God to say about me. But I don't want to be his dirty bath water right, for his feet. That's what he says in scripture. This is where I wash my dirty feet. So Elimelech leaves Bethlehem, which means the house of bread, right, which is unique, and he leaves to go to Moab, the dirty foot bath water, and he thought this was a good idea. And this is what is so strange to me, right? His name means my God is king, but is he living like that is true? No, right? He takes matters into his own hands. He's acting out of fear. And just like the people in Judges, he's trying to do what seems right to him. Anybody ever done what seems right to you and ended up in a place you never thought you would be? And so he leaves Bethlehem, right? He goes to Moab because times get really tough. And so here's the question, right? Simple and easy. What do you do when times get tough? What do you do in your life when times get tough? Do you continue to trust and obey God in Bethlehem? Or do you leave and go to Moab? Most of us would love to say, not me, my God is king. I will trust and obey. But let's make this a little practical to us, right? I'm going to trust and obey so I'm done getting drunk, right? I'm, I'm done with my addiction. I am freed from that addiction. My God is king until I get stressed out. Right until I've had a long day at work and I need to unwind. So do you trust God in that moment? Do you stay in Bethlehem or do you go to Moab? Because here's what I know, right? This is me speaking, Justin. When times get tough, Moab is real tempting, right? Moab looks good when times are tough. Here's another one, right? This, this one, struggle, I'm gonna step on some toes. I'm gonna trust and obey God's word so when I date... I'm going to keep the marriage bed pure, right? I'm not going to get physical. I'm not going to take this intimacy that was designed for marriage and put it into my relationship, right? But how many of us have said, man, I've been dating and I have been waiting and I have a burning desire for mating? (laughs) Yeah, you see, that's a lot of rhymes. Are we going to stay in Bethlehem? Are we going to move to Moab? Man. Do you trust God or do you trust yourself? Last one, right? I'm going to trust God and be generous with my time, talent, and treasure until money gets tied, until that next doctor's appointment, until my schedule gets crazy, and then I no longer have time to serve, to give, to love others. Am I going to stay in Bethlehem and trust God and obey, or am I going to take a trip to Moab, right? And let me be honest, right? When times get tough, Moab looks like an island getaway. And I, I'm not the guy that's sitting up here judging you because I've been to Moab, right? I camped out at Moab for a few days, few weeks, few months, and probably a couple years, right? This guy has been to Moab, got the scars to prove it. But it's so tempting for us to leave Bethlehem. And if we're honest, most of us have went to Moab for far lesser things, than what Elimelech and his family, right? He he had good intentions. I'm just trying to protect my family. I'm just trying to keep them well fed, right? We believe in God, right? We believe in God, but we don't believe God. And that's where the struggle comes for our life. We would say we believe in him. We would say we believe in his word, but we don't believe him. Right? Sometimes we do what's right in our own eyes, and, and I want to show you how this plays out for this family. Right? We're just in verse 2. Right? Look at verse 3 and 4 and 5. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Well, verse 3, God, thanks for playing it out. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, their life was amazing and they had no more problems. That's not what my Bible says. Look at verse 5. Both Malon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. First five verses. 
right? Naomi is left in this heartbreaking situation, right? And, and I want to paint the picture of this culture because it's a little different than ours, right? When her husband died, he provided protection and provision, right? Like he was her whole life. And so when he died, she would have had no choice but to go and live with her sons, right? Thankfully, they were with her until they weren't, right? And, and so in this season of life, she loses her husband, she loses her sons, right? Sick and tired are dead, her husband is dead, and it's just her and these two daughter-in-laws, right? This is the toughest, most helpless place she's ever been, right? The most hopeless place she's ever been. And I wanna highlight something in these verses, right? Because I missed this the first few times that I've read this. Not only did they move to Moab, but sick and tired, right? Malan and Killian, what did they choose to do? They chose to marry Moabite women. Why? Because they were away from God's people. And when they were away from God's people, right? When they ran into temptation, these sons married women that were not God's people. And I wanna give these guys the benefit of the doubt. Ruth and Orpah, were they pretty good looking? Probably. They have good personalities? Absolutely. And what do we think those two boys probably said? I think I can convert them, right? Anybody got scars from I can change them relationships? <laughs> yeah, laugh it up. How many of you guys are in one right now thinking, is he gonna tell me to break up? I am right now, break it off, <laughs> right? Break it off. Anyone got scars from I'm gonna change them relationships? And maybe that's what these two guys did. He says, trust and obey, but he says, don't be unequally yoked. Like don't get involved with somebody that doesn't believe in me. Wow. And you start to think about this, right? Why would we ever want to be in a relationship with someone who doesn't believe? If I believe Jesus is King of King and Lord of Lords and you don't, we're automatically going to have some problems, correct? What happens when I need you to pray for my kids and you're like, oh, I don't buy into that, right? Is their cuteness and their personality going to rub off and save them from whatever it is you're praying for? No, and we've all been there, right? If there is one thing that I could tell everyone who is in one of those relationships is get out fast. It's gonna hurt, but here's something that I've learned, and we're gonna talk about this later. The pain of discipline is a lot less than the pain of disappointment. Man, if I could write a book, if I could pay one of you to write a book, <laughs> that would be the title, right? Because why be in a relationship like that? And so that's one thing I just want to point out. They got into a relationship with someone who didn't believe anything like them, and it's not going to end well, right? We see sick and tired are gone, but here's the second thing, right? How long did they stay in verse 4? Anybody know? 10 years, right? It said they were going to stay a while. Now, in the south, a while could be 10 years, Right, But most of the time, well, I'm going to stay for a little bit. I'm going to stay for a couple months. We're going to let the famine go. But they stayed for 10 years. Why did they stay for 10 years? Here's the thing. If you take pictures, this is the thing to take a picture of, right? Because sin will keep you, right? Or sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay, right? And that's what happens with sin is desire, right? This temptation comes and you're like, oh, it looks good, right? Moab looks good. But if any of us have ever been trapped in sin and then freed, we know this to be true, right? Sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, right? I just want to take one step and then it's another and then it's another and then it will keep you, right? I'm just going to stay there for a while. I'm just going to stay there for a while. But that turned into 10 years. And then in our story, it cost them their lives, Right, not just their spiritual lives, but their physical lives. And Ruth paints this picture perfectly, but so does James, right? This brother of Jesus, he tells us this in James 1.15. These desires, right, these temptations give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Right, so that's what temptation turns into, right? These desires, these temptations, James tells us, hey, those temptations turn to sin. And then that sin turns to death. And so here's what's funny, right? Why did this family leave Bethlehem? Not to die, right? They literally ran away from Bethlehem not to die. And they started living their own ways, right? They started doing what was right in their own eyes. And one by one, they die. 
So re- ready the story, right? Verse 6 and 7. Naomi heard in Moab, because it's such a short distance, that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. And, and I just want to pause, right? Remember, we're in a season, right? If sometimes there's a drought and there's a famine in your life, hold on. We just sang about it. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. What happens? Here come the crops, right? And so if they would have stayed, they would have been okay, right? Give them crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab and return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah, right? So Naomi decides, hey, enough is enough. It's time to go back home. And they have this intense conversation. Naomi prays over them, and she tells them to leave, right? She's like, hey, you need to go back home. You need to marry your own people because she knew it was wrong, right? How many of us know when something is wrong and we do it anyway? Right? She knows that. She felt the weight of that conviction. She's like, go home, start your life. Because she knows that they're not going to be accepted at all in Bethlehem. Like, these are Moabites. Like, no way, no how. She's like, I'm barely going to make it. There's no way. Right? So you need to go. You need to leave. So we're going to jump down to verse 14. It says, they wept together. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. And so we get this picture of these two sisters, right? Orpah leaves, and most of you guys know this. She starts her own career as a TV host, and she becomes very successful, (laughs) right? Very successful, Just kidding. That's too good of a joke to pass up. How many of you know that Oprah really is named after her? Her mom just misspelled it, right? Unlucky. Unlucky. Should have read a little bit closer. But listen to Ruth. She's about to speak for the first time. And I I don't know about you, but imagine if this was the first words that ever came out of your mouth recorded for all of history to hear. Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And then verse 17, wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. I love my mother-in-law. Some of you do not. Some of you would never pray this prayer. But Ruth, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people, my people, your God, my God. And I am asking your God right now, if anything other than death separates me, to punish me ever so severely. Right? There is a lot wrapped up. And then verse 18, Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her and she said nothing more. Right? This is a big deal. Ruth says, I'm no longer going to worship this false God. I'm going to surrender my life to the God of Israel, to your God. And here's the crazy thing. And there's more to come on this. But had they been living the best godly life they could live? But she still saw God at work and she saw God enough in them to say, I, I don't want any part of this. I'm all in with your God. Right, I'm all in with your God. This is her declaration of faith. This is her salvation. And this is what I love. What did they do? They left Moab and they went to Bethlehem. Well, how does she have to do that? Right? How does she have to do that? You turn from Moab and you walk to Bethlehem. This is a picture of what scripture calls repentance, right? You turn from your old life and where is it? It's at your back, right? Some of us do this. Hey, old life. Oh, it feels so good to get away from you. Oh, welcome back. And we just keep doing that, right? We'll take a couple steps forward. Oh, there's Bethlehem. But man, Moab is so tempting. But what does Ruth say in this moment? I'm out. Wherever you go, I will go. Right? Your people will be my people. Your God is my God. And her back 
is turned to Moab. She literally gives us one of the most beautiful pictures of repentance in all of scripture. And I want you to hear this with everything that is in me, right? If this is the one thing you get, this is the one thing you get. But to get to the right place, you got to leave the wrong one first, right? To get to the right place, you have to leave the wrong one first. And that's what we see with Ruth, right? To get where God wants you to be, you have to walk, from, walk away from any place that's not his will. To get to the right place mentally, right? You have to leave the wrong place. You gotta take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. To get to the right place, you gotta leave some places. To get to the right people, you got to leave some people. Some physical leaving, some mental leaving, some emotional leaving, right? Because you can't live out God's will for your life with one foot in Moab and one foot in Bethlehem, right? You can't do it. And how many of us have tried over and over and over to be in both places at once? And, and this is what I love about this. Naomi understood this and Ruth is learning to understand this. This is where she risks everything she's ever known, right? She's never going back to her people. She's never going to worship her entire life that she was brought up change. She's never going to have kids and raise them in her culture. She's never going to be a part of her family again, right? She's cut off completely to follow this God and this woman, right? She chooses to turn her back on the wrong places, the wrong people, so she can embark on a journey that brings her closer to God. And if you've read the end of the book, this one decision drastically changes her life but it also brings about change that drastically changes all of our lives. This one woman becomes the great grandmother of King David, who down the line becomes the lineage of Jesus, right? So this woman makes one decision that changes the course of her entire life and now her entire legacy. We're gonna talk about that some more because it's too good, but I just had to share it with you, right? In case you're not here the next couple weeks, that's where we're going to, right? God uses her repentance to change everything. And if he can use her, he can use us too, right? And so here's the question that I want you to think about. Is there part of your life that's still in Moab, right? Is there part of your life? Is that where your mind stays, right? Is that where some of your hobbies are? Is that where some of you are, are camped out, right? Is there part of your life still in Moab, right? Is there part of your life where you're saying, my God is king. I will trust and obey sometimes because sometimes I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes, right? Are there some areas of your life where you're like, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm going to trust. I'm going to obey until it gets hard, until it gets tough. And I want to do things my own way. I want to live out my truth, not God's truth. Is there part of your life that's still in Moab. And so what I want to think about, right, is these last few moments as we close out, we get to confess what area this is in our life, right? If you have some part of you that's trapped in Moab, this is the time, right? When we, we get ready to end this part of the service, that's the time where you sit in your seat and you confess those things to God. You can come up here and confess those things out to God. You can pray through those things, but we want to do something just like Ruth, right? We don't, it's not just enough to acknowledge, oh yeah, there's some parts of my life in Moab, right? We want to do the same thing that Ruth did. We want to turn and we want to step away from that to step towards God. And that's what our desire is for each and every one of your lives, right? Is to think through that question, right? What one decision, what one choice can you make that will drastically change the trajectory of your life and your legacy, right? If Ruth never made this decision, would we ever know about her? One decision to go all in with God and it changed everything, right? One decision, what one decision could you take, could you make to leave Moab and return to Bethlehem, right? Some of us, we can surrender something to God, right? Some of us are trapped in addiction, whatever addiction that's going to look like. Some of us are too busy, right? We just hammered that for the last few weeks. Some of us are too distracted, right? Some of us 
put this career in front of other people, right? We put these things we want to pursue in front of other people, and God's like, hey, you can't live in Bethlehem and Moab at the same time. you got to take a step, and it's either towards God or away from God. Others of us, right, we got to surrender a person. we got to surrender a relationship. We have to trust God, and we have to turn away from where he is not calling us to be, right? We have to turn away from the wrong place And stop looking at the wrong person so that we can lock eyes with Jesus and then meet the right people on the way to that journey. Right? We got to follow him to the people and places that he's called us to go. Right? We don't want to just do what we want to do. We don't want to do what's right in our own eyes. We want to follow him. And I'm going to be honest, some of us, right, in these next few moments, we need to fall to our knees and just straight repent just like Ruth, right? You need to say, man, my life is broken. My life is going nowhere. I have been stuck. I have been trapped in the wrong place for as long as I can remember. And God, I want to pray just like Ruth. God, wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you lead, I'll follow, right? You are going to be my God. I put my faith, my trust, my life in Jesus as Lord, right? That means he leads your life. And Savior, right? He saves us from our sins, right? We trust in his forgiveness. We trust in the sacrifice that he made on our behalf so that we can confidently turn away and walk towards him. That's the goal, guys. That's the desire, right? Because we know to get to the right place, you got to leave the wrong one first. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I just pray that in these next few moments, you would continue to speak to us. God, show us the areas in our life that we need to turn away from. God, show us the areas in our life where we are still stuck in Moab. God, give us the grace and the strength to take a step towards you and away from the wrong. God, the wrong people, the wrong places. God, I pray and invite conviction into my own life and into the lives of every other person under the sound of my voice. God, convict us in the areas where we're falling short. And in your love, Lord, lead us to you. God, help us to remember that to get to the right place, we have to leave the wrong one. And so, God, as we create time and space, help us to do what Ruth did, to stand up, to turn, right, and literally take a step towards you. Help us to remember that temptation will always give birth to sin. And if we stay in that sin long enough, it's going to bring about death. And God, that it's going to cost us more than we ever wanted to pay. And it will keep us longer than we've ever wanted to stay. God, help us to trust you. Lead us, God. Lead us as your people to the places and to the people that you would have us to go. Help us to trust in you. The sacrifice that you made through Jesus for our behalf. God, help us to walk in that love, to walk in that forgiveness, to ask all sorts of hard questions, but to come home running to you. God, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.